Good afternoon. And welcome to today's NAJA Roundtable, Health Equity, For Whom Does the System Work? This webinar is part of a Covering Health Equity series hosted by the Native American Journalists Association and a Healthcare Reporting 101 series hosted by the Association of Healthcare Journalists. The series examines the unique challenges confronting journalists who cover healthcare and equity in Indigenous communities. Today's roundtable is intended to help journalists understand health equity in the U.S., how it is measured, and examine the agencies and organizations that make up or oversee the healthcare system. This webinar is being recorded, and the recorded video will be available on the NADA website and YouTube channel. This roundtable series would not be possible without the generous support of NAJA and AHCJ sponsor, the Commonwealth Fund, as well as NAJA sponsors Craig Newmark Philanthropies, Democracy Fund, Ford Foundation, Gannett Foundation, Google News Initiative, Knight Foundation, Oklahoma Media Center, Tegna Foundation, Society of Professional Journalists Foundation, and the Walton Family Foundation. Our panel moderator is Catherine Reed, AHCJ's Interim Executive Director and the organization's Director of Education and Content. Catherine may take questions from the audience as time allows. Please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit a question. Catherine, take it away. Thanks, Sterling. Good afternoon, everyone. As Sterling said, I am Catherine Reed, AHCJ's Interim Executive Director and Director of Education and Content. Thank you for being here. The Association of Healthcare Journalists is based at the School of Journalism at the University of Missouri in Columbia. I would like to take just a minute to acknowledge that indigenous people are here in our community now. They were here in the past. We at AHCJ wish to acknowledge and celebrate their past and continued contributions and ensure their history and voices are uplifted. We hope this webinar contributes to that effort. AHCJ was created 24 years ago to support and improve healthcare reporting, and we now have more than 1,400 members. Part of the way we do that, the support, supporting of healthcare journalists, is through our core topic leaders who specialize in particular subjects and produce content on those subjects for our members on our blog. The two people I am pleased to introduce you to now are two of our core topic leaders. Margarita Martin Hidalgo Birnbaum and Joe Burns. Margarita, who is based in the Dallas area and is a freelance reporter, is going to get us started with a discussion of health equity, how it is defined, and why it's finally getting some overdue attention. Joe is our core topic leader on health reform and something of an expert on health insurance. He'll take us through the agencies that make up our fractured healthcare system and the measures that tell us how and why it's failing so many people. We're talking about health equity a lot these days in healthcare journalism, and it's long overdue. Too many years have been wasted reporting on health disparities passively without an aggressive examination of the upstream causes and the systemic issues that hold them in place. As a starting point though, we have to talk about what we mean when we say health inequities and how best to get a handle on them through our reporting. So let's begin with Mar Margarita, who's going to lay the table for this discussion. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for making the time to attend the webinar today. As Catherine mentioned, I'm based in Dallas, and I'm the new health equity core topic leader at the Association of Healthcare Journalists. So I thought I'd start um, the uh, conversation today uh, with sharing some information about um, Native American and Alaska Native peoples in the US. And so, <clears throat> I'm sorry, am I supposed to share my screen with the yes. PowerPoint? Ahead, sorry about that. Um, yeah. Let me do that. I'm sorry. I. I uh, did not remember that I was supposed to uh, do the slideshow, so sorry. Let me uh, share my screen. Margarita, it's under the three dots right there. You I got go. it. Got yeah, it. I got it. Uh, sorry, it just took me a minute to, to get there. So. Um, 
I wanted to jump around for a minute just because I thought it would be better to show this first. So before getting into all things health equity, I thought I'd share some information from the Census Bureau about social characteristics of Native Americans and Alaska Natives, which I think you know a lot of you may be familiar with, but for those of you who aren't, um, so uh, one of the things I've learned is that there are about nine point uh, 6 million Native American and Alaska Native people uh, in the U.S. who identify also with another ethnic uh, or racial group. And 3.7 million of them identify only as Native American and Alaska Native alone. Um, Native American and Alaska Native people are younger um, uh, than uh, people from other groups. And the median age uh, is about 33 years. And the median household income um, is, as you can see on the slide, uh, $45,877. These are the latest uh, stats from the Census Bureau. They're not 2020, or at least not all of them, but they are the latest. And to give you just a little bit of a comparison uh, with the median household income of uh, uh, people or Americans from other groups, um, the median household income for non-Hispanic whites is $68,000 and change. It is $54,000 and change for Hispanics of any race and 91,000 and change for Asian Americans um, who only identify as Asian Americans. So now I'm gonna jump back uh, to what is health equity? And, um, sorry about that, let me go back here, press the wrong button. So when I, when I started out looking for information about this concept, I was very intimidated, I don't know about you, but I, think it's a big term. And as journalists, we are tasked with simplifying things for our reader as much as we can. And so I thought I'd hit on five key points that are part of this definition. Uh, concepts of health equity have been around for a long time, um, going back to as far as as far back as the mid 1800s in this country and others. Um, but it's been really mostly in the last 30 to 40 years that researchers around the world have been uh, defining it uh, you know, with much more precision and that there's been more research about health equity, not just in the US, but in other countries. Um, as Catherine pointed out in the introduction, in the US, we have focused a lot, researchers have, on health disparities without, without giving a lot of context to why they exist. And so I think that for our purposes as reporters, the most important you know, key ideas in this definition um, have, are what should guide us in our reporting. And I would say that would be uh, idea two and three, which is why, what are the, the um, trends in health um, in the population in the US and in particular minority groups who have been disenfranchised and ignored for so long? Um, and what are the reasons uh, for these disparities um, beyond just individual choice? What are factors that affect uh, social equity, I'm um, sorry, health equity and the quality of health of people. So why aren't certain people as healthy as they could be? That, um, in my mind, is the guiding question in approaching these stories. Uh, why are um, a Native, uh, Native American and Alaska people more uh, likely to have high blood pressure or die from COVID? Um, so th those are uh, th that that is the question um, that we're going to be asking ourselves to report about the, about this topic. So, one of the things I learned too in doing the research for this presentation is that health disparity is not the same as health equity, which I, I thought it used to be. I thought it was for a long time, um, but very quickly learned it's not. And so how do we define health disparity? Well, a, a layman's definition is what um, you see on the screen, a difference in disease and risk factor trends that may be linked to uh, food affordability, 
uh, literacy, exposure to prejudice, exposure to violence, access to birth control, um, exposure to poor air quality, access to primary care, clean water and sewer lines, just to name a few things that are, you know, that are considered social determinants of health. Um, and as many of you know, health disparities are tracked by gender, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity and race. And if we're lucky, there's good data on minority uh, groups, um, good health data, because there often isn't um, when it comes to Native American and Alaska Natives, or it doesn't go as far back as it does for other groups. So that is one of the challenges we have um, in reporting about this topic, that there, there might not be enough um, long-term data to be able to make comparisons um, because whether it's academic institutions or federal health departments or state public health departments or think tanks have ignored certain people for a long time. And so the, quality, the, the type of data that we may be looking for, including in, uh, data about access to clean water or food affordability or food deserts or educational attainment may not be um, as comprehensive. So I thought I'd uh, share here too some health trends in Native American and Alaska Native people. So um, this one, uh, I'm uh, not uh, realizing what the disparities uh, were. M most of my work has been in looking at Hispanic health. Um, so I learned a lot more uh, than I knew about uh, Native American and Alaska Native health over the last several weeks, is that the life expectancy is a lot lower for uh, American, um, for Native Americans and Alaska uh, uh, Natives. And so you'll see here it's uh, at 10 years in comparison to uh, Hispanic people in the US, um, about the same nine years when compared to non-Hispanic whites, um, <clears throat> and just a, a few years difference um, with non-Hispanic Blacks. Um, this is one of the latest um, death and death rate uh, tables that the CDC has um, for uh, mortality. And you will notice, um, and again, a lot of you may know this, so, um, you know, it's, or it may be news to others. Um, it, it, it was, again, because I focus on Hispanic health, um, you know, news to me, unfortunately, that the um, mortality rate is just so much higher among, uh, with the, all age groups, in uh, Amer Native American and Alaska Natives compared to non-Hispanic white, Black uh, and, and Black people and um, Hispanic Americans. Um, it, it is uh, really shocking. And so um, what are we going, how do we tell the story going beyond the numbers, right? And so th that's, um, here's, here's a table uh, related to COVID. Um, so I'll leave that up for a bit and now I'm going to switch over to um, risk factors. Um, Native American and Alaska Natives are much, 10 times more likely to have high blood pressure, much more likely to be diagnosed with heart disease compared to th their non-Hispanic uh, white peers, 50% uh, more likely to be obese com uh, compared to non-Hispanic white Americans, 50% more likely to smoke. Um, they're also less likely to uh, exercise regularly. And there are other metrics here um, in children and teens that uh, you'll be able to take a look at with a little more detail. So um, the big, the million dollar question for us is how do we tell these stories um, in a way that gives readers context about why these disparities exist? And so I, um, when I think about I was, uh, the reporting that I've done and you know, that's, uh, that's what I'm bringing uh, to the table to you, um, is how did I start going just beyond writing a story about the latest mortality report or diabetes report or heart disease and cancer report from the CDC that showed health disparities? Well, you know, when we are writing a breaking news story, essentially, when these reports drop, there's not a lot of time or room, perhaps, to give that context. But that, that's where I would start to peel back 
uh, the onion to see what is what is driving these trends, and um, you know, the, and interviewing a variety of experts, uh, you know, other than physicians, other than nurses, other than people who work in the medical profession, is important. So interviewing historians and food experts and employment researchers, religious scholars, um, who could shed light on cultural customs. Um, that's important for that bigger picture piece on why these uh, trends exist. And comparing them to um, other minority groups in the US, you know, why are these trends different in Hispanic Americans or non-Hispanic uh, non Blacks or um, Asian Americans? What are, what are some of the shared um, histories that they have in, in the context of prejudice, for example, um, they're, they're, some of that is going to overlap. So um, it's very important, I think, to uh, reach out to you know sociologists and um, historians, uh, cultural researchers, etc., to be able to give that context. Um, although um, you know some of the researchers who create these reports may also have. Um, uh, about, you know, a lot of the background about that. Some of the reports do, a lot of them don't. Um, and incorporating also information about current uh, social determinants of, uh, of health, like educational attainment, age group, um, income level, occupation, and even going back several years to give a better picture of how uh, things have changed over time, how little they have changed, or how much they have changed, um, depending on the uh, characteristic or metric that you're using. Um, I'm a big metro reader, and I think I just dated myself by using that term um, to uh, talk about local news. But uh, that, you know, for those of you who write in uh, for your local papers, right? There's a wealth of information that you could get to um, in your um, municipal governments, in cities and counties. You know, do they have health departments? Um, what kind of reports do they have about the cities and counties' access to sewer lines? When were they last upgraded? What does the broadband infrastructure uh, look like um, in the urban parts of the city versus the more rural parts of the city? I live in Dallas, um, which is a, um, it's an urban area, but you drive half an hour from where I live, which is downtown, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's very, very rural. And there is a community just, I don't know, 20 minutes away from me that does not have access to clean water lines. And so they struggle with that. And um, now and then they'll uh, write about that um, in, in this area. And it's pretty shocking. So you'll be surprised, um, uh, you know, to, in finding how much information you can get at the local level too um, about, uh, zoning policies that may explain why these disparities exist, um, why they are disparities by zip codes. Um, and I should point out the Census Bureau um, has a, a lot of uh, data that you, you can get down to a block. So, you know, use the census um, as a resource uh, for social determinants of health, like uh, educational level and occupation and income. And I got to tell you that census uh, media representatives are like librarians at a local library. They are dying to give you information. Um, that's been my experience with them. And, um, and for years, um, it's something I've noticed over the 20 years or so uh, that I've been in journalism um, off and on, that uh, they are very friendly and very eager to help. So something else to think about when uh, writing these story is that, stories is that if there is no information, that's a story too, right? What are the implications of um, underreporting disease, underreporting uh, disease trends, health trends, but also um, under what about when there's lack of information about not just about health trend, uh, health trends, but 
the installation of sewer lines or gas lines or when were they last repaired or uh, you know paved streets or the lack of police officers who may be patrolling an area so um, keep that in mind that lack of health information or data on um, social determinants of health is also a story um, and it's important to share that with the readers because it is part of uh, history so um, where to look for sources so um, I lean a lot on uh, the National Library of Medicine, right? It's one of the first places I go to find historical information um, about diabetes trends, about cancer trends, uh, HIV uh, trends. That is one of my first stops. You know, what has been written over time? And I, I find that incredibly helpful. Uh, so, and when you find these articles, look at who's um, who are the authors, and not just the principal author, but the other authors as well. Um, they might have insights that the the lead does not. Uh, so that, and usually you can find phone numbers and email addresses uh, for. Uh, the researchers, and it's a lot faster to reach out to them directly uh, than uh, going through their media people, even though they hate that, uh, the media representatives do, uh, but it's just much more efficient and it's easier. Um, and I, you know, I've also found that as long as I keep the media people informed that I've reached out to one of the researchers, um, they're happy with that. Go to um, uh, university websites and look at their faculty um, and uh, read their bios and look at the list of um, re uh, reports and studies that they've written, uh, reports from think tanks, uh, news articles, what are your uh, fellow reporters uh, writing about, who are they interviewing, um, who are they not interviewing. Um, so that'll give you a sense of that. Go through uh, advocacy groups if you want to find, you know, when you're looking for non-experts, when you want to put a face on those statistics, um, advocacy groups are very helpful. The American Heart Association, who um, is my uh, one of my previous employers, um, they're very good about that. The American Cancer Society, the American Diabetes Association, they will um, help you find people you can interview. Social services organizations, same thing food banks. These are all sources of information that uh, you can reach out to um, to get a local and national uh, you know, perspective of what's happening. Illness support groups, professional groups, medical associations, nurses unions. Um, and, you know, they also are very good about finding sources uh, for us. And finally, you know, social media, uh, not my favorite uh, you know, tool to use uh, to find uh, sources that I want to interview um, who, uh, you know, to, to like, as, like I said, to put a face on these statistics, to give them a voice about what's happening in their communities. Uh, but these are very important tools that we have now, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok um, among them. So um, I wanted to sh also share with you some stories about health equity that have run recently. Um, this is from Indian Country Today, and this is an example of, um, you know, a, a health story that has, you know, information about, you know, environmental pollution um, and uh, how how does that affect uh, communities, for example. And, and uh, this one from uh, ProPublica, um, you may be familiar with these already. Um, this uh, podcast is one that uh, I'm, I've been listening to over several weeks and it's great. This is a particularly great episode um, about the uh, history of racism um, uh, against Native American and Alaska people and how that affected uh, diet and how that has affected um, health trends in particular since the 70s um, more well I, and I'm that's the time frame that they're looking at there um, more or less um, in terms of uh, you know giving the latest data and all of that so uh, if you haven't heard that one yet um, I strongly recommend it um, that is so far one of my favorite episodes uh, because it combines um, 
uh, all, all elements, including you know cultural uh, customs and information, you know historical information about colonization, and they do a great job at you know bringing all that together to explain why the trends are what they are today. Um, so, um, I, here is a list of uh, departments of health in um, some of the states that have the largest uh, population of Native Americans and Alaska Native uh, people. Um, and I thought I'd include some uh, federal and uh, tribal entities as well. Um, when you click on the link, it'll take you there. So you uh, can find email addresses and phone numbers uh, for their uh, media contacts there. Um, this is a list of academic institutions uh, and research uh, think tanks around the country who are doing a lot of work um, in uh, studying Native American and Alaska Native health. Uh, so go forward. Um, and I thought I'd give you two a uh, just a short list of medical studies um, that have been published. Um, that I thought were uh, that might be of interest, um, which I found on PubMed, which is part of the National Library of Medicine. Um, so uh, you will find the links to that too. They have a lot of articles that are free, um, so that's um, that's very helpful. Um, and, but if they're not, you know, uh, I have found that reaching out to the researchers who have worked on the studies um, is also helpful, even if it's not available for free on, on the, um, on the database, they're, they're happy to share it with you. Um, so again, you know, finding those sources and their e email addresses, phone numbers, et cetera, and cultivating a relationship with them too, as much as you can, um, is important. Um, so I don't know if I I've gone too fast, how I'm doing on time, um, but. No, it's great. Thank you, Margarita. Okay. Um, and, you know, Sterling, we'll, we will share these PowerPoints for you to share with uh, members so people can click through those links and find what they need. You're wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. Sure. All right. Um, let's do, let me stop your sharing here. Uh, I don't think I can. Margarita, will you hit, hit stop share? Okay, thank you. So, Joe. Hi. You're going to ask me to share my screen, right? I am. <laughs> okay. Will do. Just had it. Bear with me one minute. Share screen. Here we go. <clears throat> get this out of the way like this. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, I'm Joe Burns, as Catherine said, uh, and I'm the um, healthcare reform topic leader for AHCJ. And the uh, <laughs> session title, as you know, is health equity. So the US healthcare system uh, is something I've been covering now since 1991, so quite a number of years. And in those year, years, I found that it's abnormal and it's fragmented. Uh, and I think that's a feature of it, actually. I don't think that's a bug. I mean, it is, of course, but um, I think it's kind of built into the system. And those in the system uh, benefit uh, from that fragmentation. We can talk about that as we go on. Uh, multiple agencies uh, serve different groups, Medicare, Medicaid and CHIP, the Indian Health Service, uh, VA, uh, employers, and uh, others. So employers cover almost 55% of um, workers and their families, 55% of Americans um, have coverage through employer-sponsored health care. Medicaid and CHIP cover 17, almost 18%. Medicare, about the same percentage. Direct purchase, those are people who buy healthcare directly from health insurers or on the marketplace, the uh, Affordable Care Act marketplaces, 10.4%. Um, the uninsured, about uh, eight or 9%. TRICARE, um, which is the federal government's um, Department of Defense for uh, De Department of Defense insurance system for families of those who are in the military. And then other public insurance. And uh, when I looked at this data, it comes from the Census Department. Um, other public uh, should include uh, the Indian Health Service. I think it does, but it doesn't say that. 
uh, in the Census Bureau's uh, report, which I thought was kind of a, a big omission. Um, the Indian Health Service uh, serves uh, 2.56 million, about half of all Native Americans and Alaskan uh, American Indians and uh, Alaska Natives. Uh, it has a budget of $6 billion. They spend about $4,000 per person each year, which is about, uh, which is less than half of what um, U.S. national spending per person is. Um, and of course, as, as Margarita mentioned, uh, there's a, a lot of disparities in, in the um, American Indian and Alaska Native population. They have a disproportionately high disease burden due to discrimination, poverty, and other factors, uh, including chronic liver disease, uh, diabetes, uh, unintentional injuries, assault, homicide. Uh, diabetes is an in interesting one because uh, it affects um, quite a lot of the population, something like 30 to 50%. And um, one of those causes of disparities is a lack of adequate funding for the Indian Health Service. Um, breaking it down a little further, Medicare, Medicaid, and the VHA, Medicare covers almost 62 million seniors. It has a $829 million budget. Medicaid and CHIP uh, covers the most Americans, 77 uh, 0.9 million, uh, 6.9 million are children, and 10.9 million, almost 11 million, are dual eligible, meaning they get um, care through Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, the VHA serves 9 million in commercial insurers. <clears throat> Those are all the health insurers, the big health insurance companies that contract with um, employers. They serve 177 million Americans and have a budget of uh, one point almost two, uh, one point one five million. Um, the average, so I want to talk a little bit about the average family premium uh, that employers pay for their family members, for their um, employees who have families. That amount is in 2021 was $22,221. $22,000 <laughs> would buy what? A small car, right? But you can't buy a small car every year, but we're asking American families or asking employers to buy a small car for their workers just about every year. And they share some of that, um, some of those costs with their workers. So their workers paid uh, 5969 so 5900 almost $6,000 each year toward their family coverage. And they also pay deductibles of um, 1935 for a single person, but 3722 for family coverage. So if, if we add 5969 and 3722, you get to almost $10,000 that each family is paying on average uh, for their uh, employer-sponsored health insurance. So employers are paying for a lot, but they're also shifting a lot of costs uh, to workers. I mean, $10,000 uh, per year is um, a big monthly, um, a big monthly nut. What's that? About four hundred and fifty dollars per month. Uh, that's a lot. Um, and then when you look at um, premiums, what families pay versus what workers earn versus overall inflation, we see that over the past what's that? Eleven years, from twenty eleven to twenty twenty one, family premiums rose by forty seven percent well above workers' um, earnings at 31% and well more than inflation at 19%. So in other words, healthcare costs are rising much faster than these other um, metrics. And that's, a, to me, I think that's unsustainable. But you know, as I said, I've been covering this since 1991 and that's what employers have said back in the 90s, this is unsustainable. Well, if it's unsustainable, here we are still doing it um, 30 years later. So if it is unsustainable, I don't know what the breaking point is. Um, the problem with employers shifting costs to employees is that those rising healthcare costs leave many families underinsured. Under the end of the definition of being underinsured means that you have a deductible equal to about 5% or more of your income. And then the underinsured struggle to pay their medical bills and they often skip needed care. I'm sure that you all see that in, in your um, American Indian and, Nat and Alaska Native uh, communities. Um, if employers, uh, are, if employed individuals 
mostly in the U.S. are struggling, then imagine what um, people in underserved communities, uh, imagine how much they struggle. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, my experience with the healthcare system, which is that I found it to be abnormal. Uh, a recent study from the Kaiser Family Foundation showed, for example, that 23 million Americans have medical debt of more than $250. About half of them owe more than $2,000. And if you have a, a $1,000 deductible, which you know isn't uh, too high compared to other um, deductibles that you might have from a high deductible health plan, among U.S. adults with that level of deductible, 33% skipped needed care because of the cost, and 40% struggled to pay their medical bills or took on medical debt. So um, the thing about the healthcare system being abnormal is that it's very abnormal when you compare it to, not only is it abnormal, as we just said, but it's also abnormal when compared to what goes on in other industrialized nations. The most recent report from the Commonwealth Fund on this issue, and the Commonwealth Fund has done quite a lot of studies comparing the U.S. healthcare system to the healthcare systems in 11 industrialized nations. Um, and we lag far behind in this latest study. We lag far behind in primary care. Primary care is what the basis for um, the, the U.S. healthcare system. That's the entry, right? Entry point for most Americans is their primary care physician. So despite spending twice as much uh, on healthcare as the um, average among these other nations, we have the lowest life expectancy, we have the highest suicide rate, we have the highest chronic disease burden, and we have an obesity rate that's two times higher than the average in those other nations. So we're spending twice as much and we're getting less for our, for our money. It's a, it's a system that, that, doesn't, um, that doesn't add up, it doesn't make sense. So um, I not only wanted to uh, point out the, the flaws in the system, which many of you know, but I also wanted to offer some uh, reporting resources. So uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is a good source. Uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also a good source. You know probably about the Indian Health Service, uh, the Food and Drug Administration. The Government Accountability Office just issued a report um, actually March 4th, I think it was, on um, the uh, data that there that each of the 12 uh, agencies within the Indian Health Service is supposed to get, and that data is not shared from the federal government down to those individual um, agencies. And he, uh, that's epidemiological data, by the way. So how can you manage a population uh, with COVID without having adequate um, epi epidemiological data? Um, <clears throat> So the Government Accountability Office is a, a very good source. Uh, HHS and CMS oversee the IHS, Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP, and their media staffers in regional offices are quite good sources. Uh, this is something that uh, Margarita mentioned this morning, and I thought, oh, that's a really good point. Um, uh, other resources for you, um, uh, my colleague, Kerry uh, Dooley Young, who uh, covers patient safety, and she's been covering healthcare in Washington for quite a while. She suggested that um, we all cultivate sources in Congress, such as staffer Tom Cole, uh, the Republican from Oklahoma, Rosa DeLauro, the Democrat from Connecticut, Katie Porter from California, and uh, Lisa Murkowski from uh, Alaska. The staff members, um, she said, are really quite good at uh, giving you information on what the, their representatives uh, care most about. And they might give it to you off the record, but it's um, very good uh, kind of inside um, Congress um, knowledge that you might not be able to get in other places. Uh, other places, other sources, other good sources of information, the Medicare Rights Center, the Commonwealth Fund, as I mentioned, uh, Families USA, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. There's a Health Policy Institute at Georgetown University that does great work. Um, Kerry Dooley Young also mentioned this morning, Public Citizen, that was the organization started by Sidney Wolf, uh, and also the National Center for Health Research. Um, I have found that researchers in academic setting, settings, um, settings, excuse me, and at federal agencies, as Margarita mentioned, um, they can be excellent sources. And as Margarita said, they're like librarians. Once you get one on the phone, you, they'll give you um, great detail about their work and what they're working on and what they found. So just an excellent source uh, those people can be. 
um, resources on Twitter. I'd like to know, you know, I know um, these uh, journalists, Molly Young, uh, Savannah Mayer, and uh, Felicia Fonseca, I know them only from Twitter. I don't know them personally, but I'd like to know if anyone has any other resources, um, other uh, Native American journalists to follow, especially those who are covering health or uh, disparities in health. Um, so if you want to put those in the chat, I would welcome them and I'll follow them. Um, uh, other people to follow on health reporting pro public is excellent. As Margarita mentioned, Stat News is a great source. If you follow them on Twitter um, and you need something from them, you can ask us and we'll, we'll track it down for you. The Washington Post and the New York Times, of course, are also, also do excellent um, uh, health care reporting. Um, and ProPublica has a wide variety of data, such as, you know, you're going to interview a physician, you want to know, does this physician have a conflict of interest? Is he or she taking money from pharmaceutical companies or uh, medical device manufacturers? Uh, the ProPublica database is a good place to go. If you're having trouble getting healthcare information, the AHCJ has the Right to Know Committee, and uh, they will fight for you. They'll go to those um, sources. They, they stood up for me at one time. Uh, um, CMS didn't want, wanted me to change the name of a source that I got for a story. And I was like, well, I, you know, <laughs> I'll have to look into that question. And the Right to Know Committee stepped up, stepped up and uh, did a nice job solving that problem for me. Um, the other place to get uh, really good information quickly is the AH, AHCJ's email discussion list. You send out a question and um, you get uh, answers right away, uh, usually right away. Last night I had a question about how to file a Freedom of Information Act request. I've done this in the past, but I wanted to know what, it, you know, I had some questions for our members and they offered uh, advice right away. So um, we have a, a tip sheet on how to file a, um, an FOIA request uh, that you can find on our website. The Society of Professional Journalists has one as well. <clears throat> There's a link there. Um, and one of our members suggested to me this morning, the National Freedom of Information Coalition, if you're looking for resources in the individual states. Um, my experience when making a, a FOIA request is be specific, but don't ask too much because if you ask for a whole lot, that'll just slow down your response, the, the response that you get. Um, uh, I have a, a friend who worked for the State Department for a while and that was her job was, uh, <laughs> Uh, um, fulfilling requests for FOIA um, from journalists for FOIA information. And she said, you know, the, the bigger the request, the longer it took us to get uh, anything out to people. So um, try to narrow your question if you can, but of course, you know, be specific. If possible, have an editor sign off on your request and um, uh, follow up, follow up every week. I once sent a request to CMS for a report that we were waiting for and um, it took more than a year. I think it was maybe 18 months. And, um, you know, every week or so I'd send them a request. Hey, how's, how's it going? And um, finally they did fulfill it, but it was 18 months later, as I said. Um, so here's how to reach me. If you have a question, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions I can. Um, that's my email address. Um, and that's my uh, Twitter feed. And I'm also a contributor, as, uh, as we all are, to the Covering Health blog. So um, I welcome your questions. Um, I'd like to help in any way. Thanks, Joe. Let's see if I can stop sharing. My screen. So I want to remind people who are watching to put, put questions in the Q&A, or I'm going to ask all of them. <laughs> um, you know, Joe, I always am struck by the increase in healthcare costs when we talk about this subject. What's the number one driver of that right now? I think the number one driver probably is um, contracts each year. You know, each year uh, contracts get renewed and everybody wants to take a cut of um, what they, um, you know, wants to get an increase. Um, I think in particular, uh, health plans tend to be very aggressive when they contract with employers. So employers pay a lot more than Medicare pays or than Medicaid pays. And um, for some reason, employers uh, don't have the uh, negotiating ability to fight back against what health plans are charging. 
uh, health plans uh, charge uh, employers like twice um, what Medicare pays them. So that's a big driver. Um, Inflation is another factor. Mm. Uh, it seems to be built into the healthcare system, though, at uh, greater than inflation rates. Yeah, and you really emphasized in this presentation how abnormal our system is. You were really struck by that when we did a webinar recently about diabetes. That really struck me. We had a great webinar on diabetes. We had uh, two doctors, one who treated patients, diabetes patients in Los Angeles, one who was a, a PhD researcher at USC, also in Los Angeles, and uh, another doctor, another medical doctor who was a researcher at uh, JDRF, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, and a fourth presenter who was a lawyer, also the um, uh, patient advocate for the state of Connecticut. And uh, so, you know, the, the four doctors uh, were talking about all the problems that diabetes patients have getting insulin. And, uh, you know, we did that webinar because Congress was considering limiting what diabetes patients pay for insulin at right. the point of care when they pick up their insulin. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to get a limit imposed of $35 per month, which is still a lot, $35 every single month, but they couldn't even get that passed. Um, and we had this uh, patient advocate from uh, the state of Connecticut, Ted Doolittle, and he was he was on because the state of Connecticut passed a, a similar program like that, um, and it went into effect on January 1st. So he was saying healthcare costs didn't rise, insurers did not raise their rates. Um, uh, and, and I thought, okay, good. This is someone who can address some of the, some of the problems that others would raise about such a healthcare uh, cap on insulin. But he also said at the very end, he said, let's not forget that what we have is an abnormal system. This doesn't happen anywhere else. You can, if you're a diabetes patient in France or Germany or Switzerland or you name the country, uh, the UK, you're not paying $35 a month for your insulin. You're getting it free from the healthcare system, from the government run healthcare system. Um, uh, in Canada, the same thing. People in America were going to Canada, maybe they still are, to get insulin. So, so our system is abnormal and we couldn't even put it in a $35 cap. Mm. That's just, it's just sad uh, to me. Yeah. And the reason we couldn't put in a $35 cap is there's just too much money flowing into Congress from pharmaceutical companies for one thing, right? Yes, exactly. And I just did a story about that with a journalist from Modern Healthcare, um, Jesse Hellman. And it'd be interesting to follow her because um, this talk that the Build Back Better, which was the, the insulin cap was part of uh, Biden's mm -hmm. Build Back Better agenda. And if that comes back, then uh, she's probably going to do another story on how um, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, the healthcare companies, the health insurers, excuse me, are, are going to fight it again. Um, because as soon as they, she said, as soon as people start talking about making changes like that, they talk about getting the money from Medicare. And then what the health insurers do is they say, hey, Medicare beneficiaries, you should all be very concerned about this because you're they're going to cut your cut your benefits. That was not part of the proposal, but as soon as there's a, even a whiff of that, she said, um, the members of Congress uh, get inundated with ads and calls from Medicare beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of money that gets spent uh, to prevent changes just like that that would benefit people. Right. And some pretty powerful disinformation campaigns. Uh, yes. Very powerful disinformation campaigns. Right. Exactly. I want to switch for a second and talk about um, health equity, Margarita, and talk about like getting started in reporting on health equity, um, because it is a very big and complicated subject. So for a reporter who wants to pay more attention to this subject, and even in the way that they frame stories that they're thinking of doing, what's the low hanging fruit in your community for reporting on health equity? Like the... It like a good way to start to get a handle on health disparities in your community. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm familiar with this because um, I used to be a cop reporter before I uh, went into health journalism. Right. I and remember that, yep. So um, I would start by, in, in Dallas, for example, the local county hospital, the county hospital does a report every year 
on the health of the county. Or I think, and so that's where yeah. that's where I would start. Yeah, you know what what, what are and they and in this particular case they had it by zip code. So what is happening at the local level, and then start comparing to similar counties, right? And and look at rural and urban, and that's something I didn't actually touch on when I did my presentation. But that's that's important. Um, I am reminded how rural Texas really is, just when I drive 25 south, minutes south of where I live. Mm -hmm. So um, I would start with county reports um, and then compare them to other counties in your state, um, and and then you know wondering what other you know, what are counties that may have a similar population makeup? Um, what are they doing in other states? Um, and n narrowing down the story like that, or if you wanna do a regional story, you know, looking at Southwestern states, for example, um, and, and that's, that, that reminds me of a story I did for WebMD a couple years ago within the first couple months of COVID. In the, or two or three months after we shut down, that um, and looking at what the disparities were showing, that uh, yeah, I reached out to people in New Mexico and Colorado, and I zeroed in on states that had a large Hispanic population to see what they were doing and what their stats were showing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the so that's been like the big um, story for the last couple of years, obviously, right? This, which is that COVID-19 struck certain communities and certain groups much harder and really laid bare the, the, the magnitude of, of health inequities in the United States. And there's been quite a bit of reporting on that. I'm seeing another thread now too, which is interesting um, and also another unfortunate, you know, crisis on the horizon. Well, it's not on the horizon, it's here. And that is the inequitable impact of climate change um, on the health of people in certain groups. Um, are you seeing that too, Margarita, in like the reporting on health inequities? I, I am actually the, um, one of the chapters of that podcast addresses that. And, right. and um, what, I think it was chapter one. And so, yes, I, I am, um, I, it's not necessarily something I look for when I'm looking for stories and I, because I forget to do that, um, uh, uh, find stories about environmental change um, and how that affects um, health disparities. Um, I, I, so um, I, I know that in that particular story was something that jumped at me. So, yeah. so yes, there's probably not enough, but uh, out there in general, but. Yes. Uh, one of the big stories is going to be heat um, and exposure to heat and how um, the loss of trees and green spaces in certain neighborhoods in urban areas um, is going to impact people's health disproportionately. Um, I'm, I'm looking for questions in the Q&A, but... So what, well, while you do that, if I may, I just wanted to jump in. Um, one of the health, one of the stories that I think may be a little undertold um, about COVID and disease in general, and in particular among uh, in stories of minority groups that uh, tend to have younger adults, is that they are sicker at that age than their parents or grandparents. And so what, what is that going to do for, a, you know, the generation for their children, right? And so, and, and that's been true for Hispanics and Blacks and Native American and Alaska Native people in the context of COVID. The mortality rate among the young adults, right, you know, in the mid-20s to mid-40s is uh, pretty high. And so uh, what does that mean long-term for their families, for the, you know, um, the health of their children um, and the, you know, the pressure on the healthcare system somewhat because they're gonna die younger. So I think that's a story that has a, um, hasn't been told as much. Um, and it, I think it's easy to 
forget sometimes when you're looking at the data to see the forest for the trees, right? To, oh, okay, so this is, this is what's happening. And then, well, you know, they're younger than white Americans. And so what, is, what does that mean in the long run um, that they're sicker? Yeah. And what does that mean for healthcare costs too? Because uh, if younger people are sicker, then they're going to get into the healthcare system sooner and drive up costs that way. It'd be interesting uh, to talk to a health insurance actuary about that, maybe. I want to say something. We got a message in the chat from um, Pauline. Um, Pauline, I'm not going to say your name right, I'm afraid. Um, Arialaga, Ariaga? Uh, former AP Enterprise Editor and Head of the RWJF Southwest Health Reporting Initiative at the Cronkite School of Journalism. At Cronkite News, we focus much of our reporting on health disparities in underserved communities, particularly the Native American Latino communities. Suggestions for reporting specifically on indigenous communities go directly to tribal websites for good statistics related to COVID. Don't depend on federal stats which are not as detailed. Mm. Find indigenous media outlets and follow them. There are a lot, including terrific radio outlets and programs. And don't focus on finding indigenous health reporters to follow per se. If you're an indig indigenous reporter, you'll be writing about health in some fashion. We also have a monthly newsletter that includes a lot of stats and facts about these health disparities in these communities. That's a great suggestion, Pauline. Yeah. Thank you for um, giving that to us. We'll add that to our resources. And while I'm talking about resources, I want to say that <clears throat> we have a lot of excellent resources at AHCJ too on reporting on health disparities, um, thanks to Commonwealth Fund support. So beyond our uh, reporting on health blog, we have um, tip sheets and recorded webinars and um, lots of stuff to help people get started. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Do either of you want to close with, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, I Joe, Joe we... I'd love to hear you say what, what's, whether Build Back is dead and what you think the future is for pharmaceutical. You know, we, you and I talked about the fact that people skip medications they, and they, they yeah. run out of insulin and they mm. can't pay for the strips. Um, and diabetes is a, a disease that affects um, the communities we're talking about very much disproportionately. Um, is there any relief on the horizon? Well, yeah, I hope so. Um, uh, what I read yesterday was uh, Manchin, Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, who uh, had a big role in killing Build Back Better right. the first time back in January or whenever yep. that was, um, and Kristen Cinema as well. But Manchin signaled that he was ready to, ready to negotiate again. I'm not sure that the, all the negotiations that were done earlier were done in good faith, uh, dragged the whole thing out and then it just crashed and burned. Uh, whether that will happen again, I don't know. I, I hope not. I'd like mm -hmm. to see some of those things uh, get put back in, especially the, the $35 cap on insulin, uh, but also all the other health measures that were in there. Uh, those are uh, crucial, I think, um, for pre helping to uh, prevent disparities. Right. Right. Uh, Margarita, any closing thoughts on reporting on health equity? Well, you know, I, um, they are, yes, I do, but it's related to that comment that uh, Pauline made because we, um, there was a webinar recently about tribal health. And um, I recall from that webinar that we were told that the, that the tribal, um, that the tribal epidemiology epidemiological centers don't all have the same data capability. Um, so uh, that, the not the same software is re I, what I remember hearing. And so, um, it, you know, be, I haven't, I've never had to make a records request to one of the tribal centers. So, if, and I know that the federal government has to be invited to do that. That's one of the things that they address. And so, um, you know, how, how to reach out to them would be something that, you know, that would be important. How to file a request that is uh, appropriately worded mm -hmm. um, and respectful of uh, the information and, and the, 
be, uh, you know, that, that can be made uh, uh, available to us, I think, uh, is, is important too. Yeah. Um, but it's just something that it, it reminded me of that. Um, and if, if you go to the websites of each center, you'll notice that there, they, uh, you know, you can kind of tell a little bit. Um, you know, who may be able to give you more comprehensive data than others. Um, so that's just one of the things that, that came to mind um, right. uh, in terms of thanks, requesting Marlena. data. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Joe. And Sterling, um, Thank you. you want to yeah, close thanks, us? Sterling. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you again to our panelists. We appreciate their time and expertise. I'd also like to thank our audience and we'll encourage you to subscribe to the NAJA newsletter. Visit nausea.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter for announcements about future roundtables in the series. This concludes today's virtual roundtable. We'll see you next time.